Welcome back, welcome back. I hope you've had a great lunch, and incredible networking opportunities, and plenty of time to visit our exhibitions to see the latest in war fighting, soldier readiness and support, in addition to family programs. I'm Major General Al Acock, the president of the Braxton Bragg chapter of AUSA, and I'd like to introduce our next panel, USASOC and the Future of Irregular Warfare. As we heard earlier today, the characteristics of war change constantly, even as the principles of war remain as our fundamentals. The Association of the United States Army continues to provide subject matter expert and leadership panels like this to broaden the knowledge base of Army professionals and those who support our Army. AUSA is the voice for the Army and support for our soldiers. Thank you to all the members of the Braxton Bragg chapter right here in the great state of North Carolina and to all those around the nation. If you would like to be a member of AUSA, we encourage you to sign up by visiting our booth 300 right inside the expo door or sign up online at AUSA.org. On behalf of General Brown, President of AUSA, we appreciate you being with us today. Now it's my pleasure to turn this over to our moderator, Ms. Megan Keeler Pettigrew, Chief of Operating Officer, Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my great honor and privilege uh, to moderate this very important uh, discussion this afternoon with this excellent slate of panelists. So thank you all for being here and devoting your time. I'll introduce each of them briefly, and they're going to give some introductory remarks from the podium. Then uh, at the end of all of them, we'll come back for some discussion. And we look forward to your questions as well from the audience. There are <clears throat> excuse me, cards that you can write down questions on the tables and on the end of the rows. And they'll pass those cards up to me, and we'll try and get through a lot of those questions. So first, brief introductions to my immediate right is the commanding general of US Army Special Operations Command, Lieutenant General John Braga. He previously served as the Deputy Commanding General of US Army Pacific and the Commander of Special Operations Command Pacific. Uh, to his right, Major General Rick Engel, the Commanding General of First Special Forces Command, and he previously served as the Deputy Commander of Joint Special Operations Command and the Deputy Commanding General of Army Cyber Command. Uh, to his right, Professor Caroline Davidson, an assistant professor at National Defense University in their College of International Security Affairs. And she's a Cold War historian uh, with expertise in alliances and multilateralism. And to her right, Dr. Spencer Meredith, also at National Defense University, professor of strategic studies. And his expertise is in Eastern European, Russian, Eurasian politics, and how they are a factor in this era of great power competition that we find ourselves in now. So thank you all for being here. Look forward to the discussion. And thank you to AUSA for having this event. I think it's, of course, important to build relationships. But panels like this, and I think this one in particular, help to educate and refine people's understanding of critical issues to our joint force and, and national security in general. So on to the meat of the discussion before you all give your introductory comments. Um, USASOC and the future of irregular warfare. So I think it's no surprise that those of us in the military community are very closely watching the war in Ukraine and how uh, U.S. can be as supportive as possible to our Ukrainian partners in their effort to repel and defeat uh, Russian aggression. And I think for the purposes of this discussion, it's a helpful backdrop because it has shown the complete continuum of conflict We've in this one theater. We've seen competition, crisis, conflict. So I look forward to hearing the panelists and uh, their perspectives on how USASOC fits into that continuum, how Army Soft's expertise in irregular warfare fits into that, each of the phases, and how USASOC and Army Soft are adapting to the 2022 National Defense Strategy and the priorities laid out in, in that document. So first, sir, over to you, General Braga, for your initial comments. Thanks so all much. Right, thank you. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, do I need to hear anything or am I good? Okay. 
First of all, no idea how General Angle and myself are on the same stage with two esteemed academians here. We'll be reflecting all questions and answers to that side. <laughs> <laughs> Eurasian cold war specialist. No, bit, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, thanks for the opportunity here. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty neat to share the stage briefly here. General Acock, General Brown, two of my former uh, mentors, continued mentors here. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be part of this inaugural event here as AUSA uh, hosting this, this event here at Fort Bragg, we feel privileged to be part of it and be part of this discussion here on such an important topic, an important time uh, in our really nation's history and I would say internationally, a very unique time. So a little bit, little bit about USASOC. You know, we're, we provide the Army's Special Operations Forces to the Joint Force worldwide through a regular warfare campaigning for integrated deterrence. At the same time, we're preparing for high-end conflict. USASOC defines regular warfare, and we adapt what's already in the joint pub there as a, a, in a regular warfare as a struggle among state and non-state actors to influence relevant populations and affect legitimacy. And success in this kind of warfare depends on strong relationships with allies and partners that require deliberate investment and really cannot be built overnight. It's almost like a six soft truth. You can't surge trust. So, We'd also like to talk about you know, strategic competition, integrated deterrence, it really requires influence. We're gonna talk about influence up here, I'm sure it'll come up in the question, uh, question and answers, but influence in itself is really irregular warfare. And irregular warfare really is in the domain of special operations, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit deeper as we go on here. But USASOC contributes to integrated deterrence through multi-partner, multi-domain, convergence, and synchronization of trans-regional effects and operations. And the Army's RSOF commitment through USASOC is vital to the nation because of our capability to provide asymmetric options with tail tailorable solutions and a unique mindset to prevail in any conflict. So the global strategic environment, everyone's been watching this unfold, but it features several challenges to US national interests that I think are worth highlighting. First, transformational technology and really the democratization of technology holds both promise and peril. Second, geopolitical revisions which indicate a new environment of competition where peer adversaries challenge long-held international rules, norms, and behaviors that we all prescribe to, at least most of us. Finally, transboundary complexities in the form of pandemics, climate change, and violent extremist organizations present an unprecedented array of challenges for the United States and really the globe. So SOF's value in this strategic environment to the Army and the Joint Force really is, is partly made up by our people, I would say for USASOC, partly by our, by our forward presence, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Innovation, a little bit different than modernization. I don't believe we ever modernize and it's a steady state and we get there and then we're just modern. I really believe it's a mindset. And again, we're not a platform-centric organization, we're a people-centric organization. We like to say humans are a platform and really believe that our innovation is a mindset and we believe, think that's some of the value going forward both in concepts and capabilities. And then an ability to build teams and converge effects, something I'm pretty proud to be part of in the last uh, 20 years in counterterrorism operations. So irregular warfare campaigning, it's continuous. Okay, the, the Army and, and really SOF, because I really wanted to dispel a rumor here today that SOF was built to work by and through with our partners and contribute to irregular warfare. I really want to dispel the rumor that for those who think SOF was just created to stand up for counterterrorism ops since 9-11, really don't know our history. Even in the Army Special Forces, going back to the 1950s when it was stood up, even if you go back to the foundation, uh, some of our foundational units of the country, Rogers Rangers and the rest, using asymmetric approaches, irregular warfare as a subset to traditional warfare. But irregular warfare, going back to being a struggle amongst state and non-state actors to influence relevant populations and affect legitimacy. So to do, to, to do this over the decades, we've developed literally deep generational, generational relationships with our partners. I mean, you can see this manifesting uh, right now. I mean, right now we've got over 2,800 20, 2, people deployed, 77 different countries, sometimes more, sometimes less. That same deployment cycle was there at the height of the, uh, height of the global war on terrorism. We didn't step away from those generational relationships we had around the globe. And if you just take some of the newer generation, newer uh, relationships we've partnered and fostered during the last 20 years of counterterrorism, that's manifesting right now in some of the uh, exploits in the Ukraine, 
where we've got uh, strong, strong partnerships because the, the blood we've shed and the, and the toils we've shared in the last 20 years, and it's amazing just to be part of that, uh, that community. But so soft depends on these strong relationships with our allies and partners, some of them here today, and that require deliberate investment and they really can't be built overnight. So integrated deterrence, it really requires convergence of capabilities. So through 20 years of sustained combat, one of the greatest lessons learned has been how we synchronize these capabilities, I would argue affects both lethal and non-lethal. As we analyze the future operating environment, some of it unfolding before our eyes here in watching Ukraine, we see the requirement to specifically converge capabilities. And one of the ways we're doing that and I would say a new chapter in our history is for USASOC at least and soft soldiers combining with the capabilities in the space and cyber domains. So we're developing what I like to coin is a modern day triad. And if you think about the traditional triad, it's been the bedrock of deterrence for over 70 years of, uh, of the nuclear triad, at least for the United States, and it's been the bedrock of much deterrence theory around the world. But I would argue because of that democratization of technology, we've entered a new age that we have to have new tools, new tools and new concepts, new capabilities that form what I say is the modern day triad of combining special operations, space capability in the space domain, and then cyber in the cyber domain. So what are we doing about it? Since April this year, the United States Army uh, uh, Space and Missile Defense Command and Army Cyber Command and USASOC, as well as 44 other organizations participated in the USASOC exercise focused on this intersection of the soft space cyber triad. Focusing on capabilities leading to a series of upcoming experiments and a campaign of learning. These lessons learned allow us to test our assumptions and solutions in service type exercises and joint force exercises like Project Convergence and United Pacific War Game Series in support of USERPAC. Now the intent of this triad is to really to increase the holistic strategic effects of each of the multi-domain capabilities of each other across the spectrum of conflict, both now and in the future. Trans-regional irregular warfare campaigning. I think it's important we talk about the trans-regional nature of this. So while the geographical combatant commanders and joint force develop campaign plans, we have regional aligned forces that support uh, with sustained focus and support the GCCs out there. And this really provides, because we have a footprint around the globe, really provides a unique global view of our adversaries' activities and helps us identify gaps in holistic irregular warfare campaigning across these geographical boundaries. Just like from the tactical, the operational, the strategic, there's always issues at the seams and the boundaries, and we think we can be part of that value proposition uh, against our adversaries. The conflict in Ukraine was a catalyst to stand up our own irregular warfare campaigning headquarters, and this headquarters is focused on the NSS and NDS priori priorities with the intent to develop and synchronize irregular options across the GCC boundaries. We'll talk a little bit about innovation. We talked about innovation being a mindset. You know, it's a good reminder to our own force that there is no sanctuary. We, we, we are guilty as charged of being uh, focused the last 20 years of going overseas to a Ford operating base, stretching out, getting ready for a mission, two, three, four, five missions a night, you know, coming back home, come back for deployment and being in a sanctuary. It's just not the reality in today's world. So we must change how we think about protecting and projecting our forces. Advancements in unmanned platforms challenge our legacy systems and programs. Our, our digital signature exposes individual and collective patterns of life. We must understand our critical vulnerabilities and challenge all assumptions, processes, and everything else that has been developed really for the CT fight the last 20 years. And we must consider every space and every domain and every dimension contested because our adversaries are seeking to contest in those. So innovation requires us to rapidly apply these lessons learned to modernization. We need, as a nation, we need industry, academia, warriors, policymakers to, to come together in a whole of nation, not a whole of government, a whole of nation approach to innovate against future threats. Innovation must be creative. It must be unconstrained, it must be collaborative, and it must be forward focused. And there is no end state to this innovation. And with that whole nation approach, it must match our adversaries. And, and that's where perhaps we, it would be worthwhile discussing in, in some of our adversaries who take a whole nation approach 
and ask ourselves if we are scoring ourselves, our own scorecard here for the United States, are we truly wielding all powers of national influence, not only in government, but across the nation to take on what our adversary is doing to erode international rules, norms, and behavior, and our national security advantage that exist because of this structure that has existed for over 70 years. So the strategic environment requires USASOC to optimize its force structure, develop and integrate new applications to irregular warfare, and modernize the force for multi-domain operations. Competition in the future will leverage new technology across all domains. While adversaries engage in unrestricted global competition, the United States cannot remain segmented in regionally directed responses to adversary provocations. Force structure must account for this reality and enable a globally integrated approach. USASOC can contribute by buying time for the joint force to modernize and generate resilience in this strategic environment, while simultaneously transforming our own internal formation to respond both to crises and conflict. Moving on to Ukraine. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of good conversation this and questions and answers. But when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, we, we were out of position. I'm talking for Arsov. Uh, we quickly moved to help our Ukrainian partners and had a, a near, uh, basically a permanent presence there from uh, most of the special operations, Army special operations, uh, uh, subordinate organizations of special forces, civil affairs, and psychological operations. So in response to this unprovoked uh, aggression, we made this investment of talent and campaigning in support of Ukrainian territorial defense. In Ukraine, we built enduring relationships, provided logistical support, and began training with the intent to increase societal resilience to bolster their resistance posture. As it became evident that a Russian invasion in Ukraine was imminent earlier this year, many believed that the Ukrainian capital of Kiev would fall within 72 hours. I think everyone remembers that, all the prognosis. Today, Kiev remains under control. Much of this credit, really all of this credit, really goes to the people of Ukraine and their amazing will and fighting spirit and fighting back against the Russian aggressors. Our partners are displaying undaunted determination as they fight for their homeland, reaping high returns on investment to their resistance movement. The People's Republic of China influence is increasing in scope, scale, and velocity without regard for national norms or boundaries. Just as we demonstrated in Ukraine, irregular warfare investments are required now in preparation for the PRC's stated intentions to challenge the global order. So in conclusion, the global threat landscape is as complex and challenging as it has been in decades. USASOC is fully committed to selecting, training, equipping a formation of experts in the art and the science of irregular warfare without fear. USASOC is conducting a regular warfare now across the continuum of campaigning crisis and conflict alongside our, soft par our joint soft partners, the Joint Force, with our interagency counterparts, and especially our international partners and allies, which remain key to our success. Today's challenges are truly a team sport, and USASOC will be ready for the PRC pacing threat and the acute Russian threat. They will challenge us tech, uh, with our technology, and our technology will evolve, and USASOC will continue to adapt and build an enduring advantage without fail. So we are ever mindful of the high expectations and trust that the American people demand from our formation, and we assure you that they will continue to protect the nation and free the oppressed without equal. That's our promise to the nation. I look forward to the questions and answers. Thank you. Thanks, sir. No, I'll definitely have some follow-up on innovation, I think, and lessons learned All right, from Ukraine. Look so, to it. yes, General Engel, your comments. I can't get away with just saying what he said. No, <laughs> <laughs> that was fooling. <laughs> okay, I'll try to add something to that then. Um, General Brown, great to see you. General Aycock, uh, great to see you as well. Thanks to AUSA for allowing us to, to be part of this day, and, and for our colleagues on uh, on the panel here. Um, two topics near and dear to our heart: use of shock and uh, irregular warfare. So as uh, you just heard General Baraga talk about, he really described the up and out. I'm gonna take a different tactic so we're not covering the same ground. And I'm gonna describe the down and in, right? Who's actually doing this stuff inside of our formation on a daily basis. So I want you to walk away with understanding of who we are and what we do. And then I'll provide a little bit more of the vignette on what we did in Ukraine. Uh, and then we'll meet in the middle during the question and answer. So uh, first Special Forces Command, 
Now, we are the premier partner to regular warfare force. That's what we strive to be every single day. Okay. We're a two-star subordinate command in the United States Army Special Operations Command, General Braga, he's my boss, right? We're 23,000 men and women. So if you think of us as the Army Special Operations Division, we'd actually be the largest division in the Army. Those 23,000 people are spread over 11 group or brigade size elements. It includes five active duty special forces groups, two National Guard special forces groups, two psychological operations groups, a civil affairs brigade, and a sustainment brigade. We represent one third of all of the United States Special Operations Command. So, very large element. We have two primary missions. First one is provide trained and ready forces to the theater special operations commands in support of the geographic combatant commands. The second one is to be to form the Army Corps of a two-star warfighting headquarters called a Special Operations Joint Task Force. Right? That is a two-star warfighting headquarters that is certified and validated that SOCOM can deploy in the event of a crisis or a conflict. What capabilities do we provide to the Joint Force? Primarily four of them. The first one is Army Special Forces. Most people know them as Green Berets. Their primary mission is to conduct unconventional warfare in contested or denied environments with an indigenous partners along with allies and partners. And second one is civil affairs. They focus on civil reconnaissance, civil governance. Third one is psychological operations. Their primary mission is to influence. And then finally, we have the 528 Sustainment Brigade. They provide us critical intelligence, logistics, medical, and communications support. And we really can't do our mission without them, and they provide a tremendous amount of capability that reduces the risk to the Army's theater support commands and logistics support they have to provide soft operations. So when you call for Special Forces Command, what do you get? You get a tailable, scalable, task organized for purpose unit of action that is built in men and women who are specially accepted, selected and trained to operate in complex environments and conduct irregular warfare across the competition continuum in all domains. One of the values that we provide is the fact, as the boss talked about, we have a persistent presence forward. So any given day, we have roughly 3,000 teammates in 70 countries. Right? We are culturally capable, language capable. We are geographically focused. And that allows us to build deep knowledge and expertise within our AORs. Right? It also allows us to build generational relationships that General Braga had talked about. Okay? That deep knowledge, expertise, and those generational relationships allow us greater access, placement, and influence with our allies and partners. So what does that mean on the ground? Okay? As General Braga mentioned, since 2014, we've had all of these capabilities in Ukraine. We deployed there as a result of the Russian invasion into the Donbass to support the Ukrainian partners. Right? Our special forces elements immediately partnered with the Ukrainian soft element there. And over the past seven and a half years, have taken that element from a legacy Spetsnaz type element to an element that was NATO compatible, that was able to operate, operate decentralized off of intent-based orders. Okay. An element that now is carrying a heavy load for the Ukrainians in their fight against the Russians. We we're also able to build resilience into the Ukrainian legislation. So our folks actually helped write the legislation that developed both the territorial defense forces and the resistance companies inside Ukraine. On the psychological operations front, we were able to help build a capability inside of Ukrainian SOF to be able to message appropriately, right, and be able to compete effectively against the Russians in the information environment, which they continue to do today. From a civil affairs perspective, we conducted civil reconnaissance in eastern and southern Ukraine. We focused on infrastructure and routes. We also conducted civil engagement and human network development to be able to put in place the relationships and the networks needed to be able to support with non-lethal aid in the event that a crisis happened. In addition to that, we were able to build a civil affairs capability inside of Ukrainian SOF. 
All of those efforts paid off in spades once crisis happened. And as we had to eventually leave the country, okay, we were able to use those same networks to push tens of millions of dollars of non-lethal aid into Ukraine. Right? So that small vignette right there just provides you an idea of the value proposition that we provide in an irregular environment, irregular warfare environment that's playing out in front of you today. Look forward to your questions. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Professor Davidson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. You can see me. I was too busy taking notes to realize that it was actually my turn to talk. <laughs> it really genuinely is an absolute honor to be on this panel today. Um, and I, I heard both our commanding generals say, explain a little bit about where they're coming from. So let me tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. So Dr. Meredith and I both teach for National Defense University's College of International Security Affairs. What is fantastic about our program is we are right here at Fort Bragg, which means we have a master's degree program we offer, that it means our neighbors literally are first SFC, SWIC, and USASOC. So when engagements like this come up, we have a fantastic opportunity to talk to a wide audience. Similarly though, when something like Ukraine kicks off, we have the opportunity to engage on the spot as academics whose knowledge, particularly Dr. Meredith in, in the most recent example, is really helpful. So having that geographic proximity to the force makes us really special, I would argue. And that would be the prelude, you can guess, to what I'm gonna say, which is that education is an absolutely essential part of the future of a regular warfare. So my, the first time I ever came across AUSA was the Army 10 Miler in Washington, DC, when I used to be up there. And I was running with some friends the other day telling them that I was gonna do this event. And they said, well, would you rather get up in front of a large group of people or would you rather go run the Army 10 Miler again? And that got me thinking, right? It depends on how hot it is outside, part one. If it's like this, no thanks, I'll do this first. But that got me thinking too. So I love running because it gives me a chance just to simplify my life, right? All I need to do is train. You train harder, you get faster. You go point A, point B. All is easy in the world. No. Any of you who are runners know that absolutely is not the case, right? Injuries happen. Depends how hot it is outside. Depends who you've got cheering for you on the course. So it is way more complicated. And we have a tendency to think, okay, physical training, that's straightforward. And we neglect the fact that for this force in particular, and in this environment, intellectual training is an absolutely key component of what we do. We have physically fit personnel, right? What about mental and educational fitness as well? So I heard General Puppas this morning emphasize readiness, and I'd throw out to you, he mentioned training, but I want to emphasize that readiness has to include education as well as training, particularly in this environment. And that's where we can get into readiness for what, which is the other question he threw out there that I'd love to hear my co-panelists get into as well. This panel is gonna be focused on readiness for irregular warfare. What does that look like? The future of irregular warfare requires investment in education. Education is an essential component of IW for our forces and for our partner forces too. Your brains are a massive capability. We don't expect to have physical strength without training. Why do we expect to have cognitive strength without education? So why did I say particularly in this environment? We can get into this a little bit. The bottom line is if we can't think nimbly about competition and how to use the tools we have available both effectively and efficiently, we're gonna lose a vital edge that we have. At NDU, we like to say that we, teach, we do teach in our program both officers and NCOs, which I think is a really important point to emphasize. Both officers and NCOs need education. We teach for irregular warfare. We're preparing minds for complexity, to think outside the box, to ask questions, not just push for answers, to develop that other phrase that we love to discuss, strategic empathy, to understand the human dimension. So irregular warfare requires an educated force. We need smart technology, absolutely, we all embrace that. We need human ingenuity. You can't have smart bombs and not so smart personnel. We need both. And the stakes here are really high. At the essence of competition lies choices. 
And the US could choose not to compete. We could take ourselves out. We can focus on home. But the price of that retreat would be the steady erosion of the world that we have spent so long building. And that's me speaking as a historian. Right? The cost of preserving the world order is going to be competing effectively. And irregular warfare represents one important set of tools that can help us compete effectively. IW is now what we call, or the Joint Staff calls, a sustained area of emphasis in JPME. That means everyone that goes through JPME has to learn some irregular warfare. What I think has been really interesting to see how the J7's Office of Irregular Warfare and Competition has handled this is they've come to us and say, look, we don't want IW just to be an elective. It's got to be woven into all that good strategic learning that you offer as well. It's should be implicit and explicit in what we educate on. Education complements training. It has to, right? But it's got to go further as well. We need our people to think strategically, to think creatively. You've heard some of this already. And to think critically. And to think critically means being prepared to question assumptions, our own and others, avoid echo chambers, mm -hmm. get academics talking to practitioners. This is the value of what we do. We also help educate on how to articulate ideas in an effective way, because we have to be able to do that. You have to be able to do it to your teams. You have to be able to do it to the conventional force. We have to be able to do it to our chain of command, to our partners and allies. But the second rule of education is one of explaining about irregular warfare, not just for, what about irregular warfare, what it is and what it is not. And that's certainly something we're all hearing a lot of. You know, is it everything or nothing? Where, where, where is the definition here? We do have to be able to articulate what irregular warfare is and also the advantages it can create. Academics will debate. We could have two hours of definitions just with Dr. Meredith and I going on and on. You could all fall asleep. But there's practical importance to that defining process too, right? We can't educate on irregular warfare unless the terms we use translate for policymakers, for our partners, for our conventional peers, for our interagency peers, into something they clearly see as useful. So one of the very smart people at Solik that we had the chance to engage with throughout an example I think helps explain what I'm getting at here. He made the argument that we should not necessarily talk any longer about unconventional warfare. We should talk about support to resistance. And we are starting to see a little bit of this lexicon. Why would he make that case? Sidelining the warfare part of UW makes it easier to push for the inclusion of non-lethal tools. General Angle and General Berger, I think, both offered a little bit of a definition here. We talked about a struggle. The word violent in that struggle has been dropped from our definitions. We should talk about what that means. That also then gives those tools more agility for a competitive environment. So doing that can also produce strategic effects that influence populations. There's my bingo for General Angle to influence populations. And affects both the legitimacy, legitimacy of partners and adversaries. It makes it much clearer what UW is at the strategic level. It allows us to speak to supporting resistance movements both offensively and defensively. Maximum flexibility is going to be key here. But maximum understanding is also going to be vital for us. OK. Modernization, yes, requires modern minds. And I completely agree this has to be a continuous thing. But in this environment, we really do need an intellectual paradigm shift. We need to look at the origins of special forces why they were created in the first place. 20 years ago, the forms of warfare we characterized as irregular were pretty slender, right? This is some of the familiar pillars, COIN, CT, FID. Today, the number of activities we consider as irregular are proliferating. And it's almost impossible to imagine that activities like counterinsurgency ever didn't have a continuous information dimension like they do now. Psychological operations, civil affairs, Counter-threat finance, counter-threat networks, security force assistance, they are all big, important parts of irregular warfare now. And they're essential to each of those more familiar pillars. OK, so irregular warfare equals an essential part of warfare, period. A priority means of sustaining a competitive edge, cementing advantages, restoring stability post-conflict. Back to that continuum, we've got to include the post-conflict part, too. Power is multidimensional. Competition has to be multidimensional as well. 
So if we can dominate not just the traditional domains, but the dimensions of competition, we're going to debilitate those powers seeking to shake up the international system. And we'll anchor them more effectively, potentially, than traditional warfare might. So the magic there of a regular warfare is to wage war without fighting. And special operations are the masters of gray zone activities in doing that because the human dimension is our dimension. That said, we're also recognizing a trend, right, where the Department of Defense is more likely to be a supporting element than a supported element for those modern forms of irregular warfare. Okay, a few other points. Irregular warfare puzzles don't always have pieces that fit neatly together. Yeah, that's frustrating. We have a lot of students that, are, that come to us and say, just give me the answer. What is the answer? I would be lying and I would be dishonest as an educator if I said there are easy answers out there. The metrics of success for irregular warfare are really challenging. How do we measure trust? How do we measure resilience? How do we measure will? A lot of it can come down actually to having those people that we have forward positioned and what their assessments are. As a historian, I have to put in a plug for the past as an important instructor. To innovate, we just we don't need to know just where we're going in the future. We also need to know where we've been in the past. We can't understand what motivates our adversaries or our partners if we don't understand their history or our own. So history is essential to strategic empathy, building trust, building partners, developing understanding. There is tremendous value in historical case studies when used appropriately. They can also inform our wargaming and should. But the past also teaches us general lessons about the importance of understanding complexity, multi-causality, thinking long-term, and the risks of the manipulation of history to build resentment, shape expectations, and undermine trust. So in the Q&A, I can get more into why I think we should be careful students of the Cold War. You can guess, again, that's something that I care deeply about and I think has a great deal of merit. So the last thing I'll say as a kind of lesson for us all to consider is the importance of smaller powers in great power competition. I'm not a fan of the phrase great power competition. I prefer just to talk about either strategic or long-term competition, partly because I think we do ourselves a disservice if we think of GPC simply as Russia and China. Again, a really important lesson from the Cold War is the disproportionate influence a lot of those smaller countries can have. And we're seeing that play out, right? From Taiwan to Ukraine, but also Lithuania, the Solomon Islands. Who knew we'd be talking about the Solomon Islands? And we can get into why Sweden and Finland have ended up joining NATO as well. All of that is going to have a tremendous impact. IW and education is also going to matter for our partners and allies. How do they understand irregular warfare? How do we help our allies develop the tools we consider helpful to have on IW? Building partner capacity is not just training, it's also educating. We can help provide a common lexicon, an understanding of irregular warfare. And IW can offer tools of reassurance and play a vital role in integrated deterrence. Bottom line, the US is gonna need every bit of intellectual preparation it can get. We can't surge trust at times of crisis, we get this. We can't surge intellect and education either. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Davidson. I'll definitely ask you to put your historian hat on in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Dr. Meredith. Okay, so I get to bat clean up on this one. So that's, that's a great honor. Um, so it's now ubiquitous. Everybody knows that Putin made a mistake. Got it, and everybody's saying it. Everybody's coming out of the woodworks and saying, look at what they did, we knew it was gonna happen. That wasn't the general consensus back in January and February. So Putin fell on his face. Why did he fall on his face? Well. I, I've had the pleasure of working with General Braga and General Angle before in different efforts, some of it related to Ukraine. Um, I've served a little bit about myself. I've, I've served as a strategic advisor for irregular warfare working groups with SOCOM, with USASOC, and with JSOC, specifically around this area of thinking better to do better. And that's a hard task. My, my great colleague and friend, Professor Davidson, outlined the core of why that's so important and so difficult. So going back to this initial discussion of what's going to happen in Ukraine, the general consensus was Ukraine's going to fold. And I recall saying, maybe not. Why? Well, 
for the better part of 10 years, I've spent working with various levels of the Ukrainian government, from the local all the way up to presidential and parliamentary aspects, working with them to develop governance and democracy, broadening, deepening, thickening connections, as well as counter Russian malign influence. A good friend of mine was deeply involved in starting propelling, keeping going, and at the very last, sustaining the Maidan revolution as government forces were coming and trying to eliminate them. The point is, those relationships give understanding. So I'm going to echo and add to my colleagues on the panel. What SOF is so good at are human relationships. It's the network, yes, but it's the relationships. It's building placement and access. It's developing understanding so that we can then propose and execute options, either that we do ourselves or that others do as well, the integrated nature of it. OK, so let's go back. Why did Putin get it wrong? Because the Kremlin has never understood Ukraine, never. The Kremlin has always seen Ukraine, and Belarus, the Caucasus, Central Asia. They see even people that are ethnically Russian as Russian serfs, servile, stupid, and weak. Now, that's not the way Ukrainians see themselves. Trust me, my wife's Ukrainian, OK? We have some knocked down, dragged out arguments, right? And she wins often. So point is, the Kremlin almost always, in their calculations, miscalculates, which is why they make so many great mistakes. What does Russia have in its favor? Mass. They don't use it very well. So on the one hand, we looked at Russia and thought, Wow, this is giant behemoth, this juggernaut. And what we found out, and those of us who'd worked on it for a while, it's actually just a big, scary balloon. And when you pop it, it fizzles, right? And that's what we've seen. OK, so Putin made a mistake. He was strategically irrational, and he did something that was basically nonsensical. Why did he do it? Most likely because of his relationships, the relationships with those that support him. He doesn't rule monolithically. He's got his people that he needs to ensure are happy. He's also got to make sure that those people provide him the goodies that he wants. There's a dynamic relationship there. So I'm going to come back to that when we talk about the lessons learned. All right, so RSOF, as one of the core elements within SOF, within DOD, within the US government, and then connected to partners, as my colleagues have said, is at the epicenter of irregular warfare because of those human relationships, which, as we know, the soft truths, they don't turn on a dime. So how, then, do we use soft most effectively, specifically our soft, within this broader competition space, competition conflict space? So there's a couple of things that I would propose and that I've talked about, and some of my friends and colleagues in here that I've worked with have heard this refrain before, cost and position. Well, what exactly does it mean to impose costs on an adversary? Yes, thanks, that's great, let's go do it. Well, let's pull it down a little bit. Let's tease it out. Let's open the black box. Let's do some creative, critical thinking. Well, basically, it means the five Ds of dodgeball. Just kidding. So first, you can, you can disrupt. You can simply, I don't know, throw a monkey wrench in the process of whatever it is. All of us spend way too much time on emails. You know what Monday's like when those dumpster fires are falling from the sky because you've got this long list of emails you've got to deal with, right? It's in academia as well, believe me. They're just more annoying because they're more intellectual. They're equally irritating, OK? So the point is, imagine doing that to an adversary, putting another set of requirements, tasks, complication. The server goes down, whatever it is, traffic jam. So you can, you can degrade. You can also disrupt, right? You can make a process actually cease functioning. You can also deny. Well, those first three Ds are in that phase zero pre-conflict. We're building stuff. We're there. We're not actually shooting yet, OK? It's not large-scale combat operations. But SOFT can also do that as well. It can support those with the classic, we're going to destroy things to defeat the enemy. So SOF is incredibly fungible in that regard. And our SOF in particular, because of all the elements of the SOCOM compendium, 
RSOF is the one that reaches out and touches people most directly, right? So all the other ones are great, but if you like getting your hands dirty and shaking those dirty hands, that's what RSOF is good at, right? So Putin doesn't understand that. That's one of the reasons why he messed up so badly in Ukraine, because he didn't understand the Ukrainians. He didn't understand the human relationships. Classic example, small little city northeast of Ukraine, Sumy. Just a little, one of those little towns, little cities, right? And yet, when Crimea kicked off, those people in Sumy self-organized. It wasn't a government directive from Kyiv or the governor or the mayor. People just self-organized and set up self-defense patrols around the city at all the entry points to ensure no little green men came in. And they stopped several Russian provocateurs because it's only like 30 kilometers from the border, right? So the Russians didn't understand that. They didn't learn from 2014 in all those instances. And the same things occurred in the current war. Sumy has been one of those critical nodes that the Russians tried to reinforce Kyiv, and they got stopped, turned back, destroyed, or their forces basically said, look, we don't want to do this anymore, and they went home. So human relationships in Ukraine have been central to Ukraine's defense. It's, sorry, I gesticulate a lot, and I, I'm not used to mics, sorry. So in Ukraine, we can call it an insurgency, but it's not. We can call it resistance, it's not. It's defense. This is a war, an irregular warfare. To my colleague comment, it's an integral part of the war. This is not post-conflict. This is the war. OK, so what do we learn from Ukraine? Well, we can learn the role of the network and how to do logistics. We can understand the persistence of relationships. All that is good stuff. Let's do more of it, absolutely. I think a better question is, what are our adversaries learning? Specifically, what is Xi Jinping learning? I would propose he's learning a couple of things. Number one, it confirmed what he suspected for quite some time about Russia. Classic example, when BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, was first kicking off and it was gonna move up through Central Asia, which is Russia's soft underbelly, its backyard, what are you doing in Central Asia? So the Kremlin said, well, you can use our rail system. We've already got it built, good infrastructure, you can use it, pay us transit fees, put some money in our pockets, it's gonna be good. And Beijing said, thanks, but no. Why? It's old and decrepit and unreliable. What a blow to the Russian ego. What makes Russia great and powerful, right? Is heavy industry, rail, steel, right? They're a 20th century power with a few sprinklings of the 21st century. So Xi Jinping has known for some time what we're sort of waking up to, that Russia is a Potemkin village. It's a, it's a storefront with nothing behind it in many ways, right? So it confirms that, which basically then sort of says now, Xi Jinping, sorry, I keep hitting this dumb thing, sorry. Xi Jinping is saying to Putin, I know that you know that I know that now you, no, wait, you're not really as strong as you were, right? So he's kind of smiling. But more importantly, what's he learning about Taiwan? I suspect, and I would argue, that he's learning to pause. Why? What is it that makes Ukrainians do so well with so little? Now granted, they are receiving critical support, without which they would not be doing what they're doing, okay? So the sine qua non, the wow, without which not, something in Ukraine and something that their partners are providing. Those two have to be together. So Taiwan, hmm, sounds similar, doesn't it? Something within Taiwan and something that the partners provide. So what's that thing within Ukraine that's similar to Taiwan? National identity. Several academics from different disciplines debate the value and the role of nationalism. Some would argue that it's an inherently bad thing. I don't believe that. I think nationalism is. It can be good, it can be bad. I remember giving a, a lecture at the Marshall Center in Germany, this joint US-German long-standing relationship there to foster partnership. And I gave a speech on the, the role of ethno-nationalism in Europe's future and countering Russian malign influence. And it was funny to watch because the Italians were going, yes, nationalism's great. And the Germans were going, no, nationalism's bad. And the French were going, meh, it could be good or bad, right? <laughs> so nationalism is, it's potent in Ukraine. There's no intrinsic, well, I'm Russian because I speak Russian and I'm Ukrainian because I speak Ukrainian. 
they all speak Russian and Ukrainian, right? My wife and her parents, my parents who are now out of Ukraine, thankfully, living with us, we got them out, which is safe, it's, it's great. But they speak this weird polyglot thing. They make up words. Isn't that the case in every country, right? So Ukrainian nationalism is a potent thing. I promise you, it's equally potent in Taiwan. The narrative that exists from Chiang Kai-shek on to today is that Taiwan is not part of one China. So Xi Jinping is looking at Taiwan and going, hmm, maybe the resistance will be a little stronger. We hope he's learning that, because that is something we can support in messaging for integrated deterrence. Deterrence is preventing the adversary from thinking and therefore doing what we don't want him or her to do. Okay, so what are we learning? What are they learning? Now I'm gonna tie it back into education in my remaining moments because I am an academic, professor of national security strategy, and I also do this other thing, strategic advising to the operational force. So I like little triangles. So if we start at the top of that little triangle, we're talking strategic thinking. Well, what exactly is strategic thinking? It's it's not any more complicated than that's my goal and how do I get there? Well, people write books on it and here's how to and you have six week seminars on it. It's really not that complicated. It's what's my goal and how do I get there? But surprisingly, we rarely do strategic thinking. How many of you have been in meetings where you have said, hey, here's a problem, let's solve it. And you start putting things out there. Oh no, we can't do that. No, 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 that's not gonna work. No, 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 this obstacle here. Well, that's not the way, right? We don't let the good idea fairy float around, but strategic thinking in many ways is letting those ideas be put on the table, right? So the first is strategic thinking. Other side over here is content knowledge, and this is the beauty of National Defense University, College of International Security Affairs, and specifically our joint special operations, Master of Arts programs. That is a lot of words, okay? is that we exist in all of these points. And in terms of content knowledge, we bring the academic stuff that's like the long-term perspective, the deep studies, you know, but it's not in the ivory tower because it has a purpose. And we come alongside our participant colleagues. Yes, they're students and yes, we're the teachers, but in reality, as we always say, we're learning as much from them as they learn from us. So content knowledge is more than just book learning and it's also more than just you don't know, man, you weren't there, right? That third and final piece over here is critical. And that's why SOF, and RSOF in particular, and this relationship that you're seeing up here, operational effect. Both of those have to produce better operational effects for the nation and for our partners. And I'll end with this. This is my cheerleading speech. For those of you who are not involved in Army Special Operations, it's a great place to be. For those of you that are, it's a great place to be. So thank you very much for letting me be here, be a All cheerleader. Right. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks. OK. Thank you, Dr. Meredith. Uh, so thank you for discussing what you think perhaps China is learning um, from the war in Ukraine. I'm going to flip it back to the US and, and our partners and General Braga, General Engel, if you could explain to us how USASOC and First Special Forces Command is looking at the war in Ukraine and what lessons learned you're taking from that and how it might apply to other theaters. Well, I'd say I think, first of all, the, the most strategic lesson and reinforcement lesson is the power of information operations. And uh, you know, President Zelensky has, has been a master Churchillian-like uh, figure that Without the international support uh, supporting his cause, the, I think the effects would be very different right now. Um, it's been amazing, absolutely amazing to watch what, what captures the world's attention in some human tragedy stories in, in certain parts of the world and some that just don't, and this one certainly has, so that's been amazing to watch. That wouldn't have happened in a comms degraded environment. Mm. It wouldn't have happened with pictures not getting out and showing the atrocities, and it would have been just, uh, it would have been claimed as disinformation, like it is internal to, to Russia right now. It's, it's not happening. The special operation's not happening. We're restoring whatever, whatever they're making up this week to go after. But the power of information ops, I think, is one of the, uh, the biggest lessons learned, be it 
throughout the whole spectrum of conflict that you've mentioned. You're seeing all phases of it, high-end kinetic, large-scale competition or, or, or conflict uh, and operations, uh, and, and a mix of everything going on right there. So it continues to this day. And I would say even how we have to double down on both the education piece and the intel support to information operations, because ultimately at the end of the day, we can have a war of attrition, I'm gonna destroy all your, your red icons or you're gonna destroy all my blue black icons, or are we going to cognitively target to get someone to think differently to change their behavior? And how are you gonna impose doubt cost and belief upon that individual, in this case Putin, could be Grasimov, could be Dvarnikov, could be any one of their senior leaders on the battlefield and get them to think differently, as well as their individual troops on the ground. Uh, you know, morale and will is an important part of composition, discipline, and strength in the outcome of a war. Uh, so again, I would say I, there's plenty of technical ones. I'll pass the mic to Rick there and I'm sure he'll hit some of them, but I would start off with information operations. General Engel. Yeah, certainly I would agree with that. Uh, I'd offer that President Zelensky is probably the most powerful weapon that Ukraine has. His ability to build an effective narrative that's rallied a population as well as like a global community in support of Ukraine uh, has been incredibly effective, right? So what do we learn from that? How do we en enable that? Um, is this something that we have to take away? I'd also add, um, don't learn the wrong lessons, right? Not all the lessons that we're learning from Ukraine are going to apply to Taiwan. And it's just as important to make sure that we don't learn the wrong lessons as we do take the right lessons over. Uh, certainly one of them is uh, early investment. Uh, we talked about how, at least from a soft perspective, we've been involved in Ukraine for you know, seven and a half years and the effects we've been able to achieve there. You know, we potentially don't have that long in Taiwan. And so are we willing to make the investments now to increase both the capability of uh, their armed forces but are we willing to invest now to increase the resiliency of the population that Spencer talked about? Um, when you're talking about resistance movement, I would offer the most important thing you can focus on is the will of the population to fight. Um, and so how do we take that lesson that we're seeing in Ukraine and apply it to potentially Taiwan? Um, but also offer the importance of allies and partners, right? Um, those generational relationships that we have discussed um, uh, those generational relationships that we're building with allies and partners, um, that whether we've fought with them over the last 20 years of CT, or it's even been deeper than that, going all the way back to the 1950s and the 1960s, you know, having those allies and partners along uh, to be able to support in an operation like Ukraine and potentially in, in Taiwan is incredibly valuable. Um, with the limited footprint that potentially um, the U.S. has on the ground there, our allies and partners are actually providing a lot of the support to the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian SOF, okay? And so our ability to have those relationships is extending U.S. influence through our allies and partners on the ground. You know, it also ensures that if they're going to bring those allies and partners, those SOF elements, you know, those countries are going to be part of that coalition as well. Right? So if we ever look to, to do you know, something in the South China Sea, we, we have to do it with allies and partners, right? That is both a comparative and leading to a competitive advantage for us. So there's a couple. Professor Davidson, with regard to partners, allies, how do you think the current constructs of our alliances um, are best, you know, structured and positioned to be leveraged for regular warfare? Are we using them correctly? Do they need to be you know, modified, revised at all? Yeah, this is a tricky, wide-ranging one, and, and you've heard us all do it, right? We've all said partners and allies, like they're all the same. And of course, we all know that that's far from true. It's far from true in terms of geographical differences. It's far from true in terms of our treaty obligations to some countries, vice some partners that we work with that, they don't, that we don't necessarily have formal obligations. Again, as a student of NATO, um, I think it is really interesting to see, of course, how NATO has adapted to what they tend to term hybrid warfare rather than a regular warfare. There's a greater degree of comfort, like with nationalism, with hybrid warfare over IW. But they're interested in IW on the NATO side, partly because there are so many smaller European nations who are deeply concerned existentially right, about their security and they want to leverage their strength. So by the time you talk resistance and resilience, there's a degree of creativity going on right now within different specific countries and also within NATO as an organization. 
So NATO soft separately from special forces elements within some of those European countries. I think it's important to consider them slightly differently, but they're definitely interested in learning more about this and, and there is a willingness to invest in those capabilities and learn. One of the things that I know Spencer and I have very much enjoyed is the fact that we have so many USASOC liaison officers from NATO countries. And again, in terms of those conversations, us learning from them and how they consider a different problem set, I think is a huge asset for USASOC as well as us as educators. And then of course I do hear a lot of, okay, we need a NATO for Asia, right? Is, is there something there that we can replicate and I share your concern, sir, that you know, they're different theaters and there are different cultural, historical ties, the way NATO evolved versus the, what we tend to call the hub and spoke model in the Asia Pacific region. Um, I do think we need to pay close attention to partnerships like the Quad and the way that they're developing. I do think it benefits the United States to think about multilateral opportunities as opposed to just bilateral relationships because it can be more efficient for us, but also because it can send an important signal that the United States isn't dictating, unlike China. They're collaborating. They're listening, as well as making suggestions. So, yes, lots of good stuff to learn. I think NATO is adapting in really important ways and that we can encourage that adaptation and really constructive routes too. And then we can think about some of the transferability, but also with some caveats there to what might be appropriate in other regions as well. Thanks. If I could add to that, just on the allies and partners, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not like the counterterrorism fight last 20 years was so right. black and white. I mean, every country will act in their best interest, right? And they have their own national security objectives, their own caveats. And uh, we've worked through that in, in uh, act activities in Syria, in Africa, in the Middle East, in the Levant. Um, that, that's really not too much different, that's just, that's normal foreign policy. Uh, but the nuanced way that this soft kind of unofficial international, I would say brotherhood and sisterhood around the globe, it has influenced strategy, in some cases policy, in some cases law of respective countries of just ideas as every uh, head of government has to weigh so many different things uh, for their own national interests. Uh, it's an a, it's, sometimes it's a way to incrementally work your way through that. And I, see, I, I think you see that unfolding in Ukraine. It's very uh, serious and no one wants it to escalate. Um, but you, you know, people are dying and each country's making their own decisions. So um, it's almost like a tier two diplomacy there from the, the international soft community that we help our respective, uh, in support of our policy, uh, brothers and sisters in the, in the State Department and, and, and higher at OSDP and, and like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sir, General, I, oh, Can I, I was go gonna ahead. follow up on that, but sir, if you wanna go ahead. No, okay. go ahead. Okay, so, so picking up on that, right? How do we strategically prioritize? Obviously, at our level, I mean, you, you sir, obviously, you have more influence at that level than, than we do. We're just academics uh, in our books. But in the sense of shaping strategic prioritization, we can have an influence because we can speak with those who are asking for our input and shaping the decision making. We can shape the narrative internally about how do we prioritize. So, what does that look like? You mentioned a couple different places in the Middle East. So if we were to look at strategic prioritization, we've tried to do this, pull back. Afghanistan, we'll just leave that there. Um, people's views about Afghanistan, but we tried it with SDF. Should we have done it the way we did it? Should we have done it when we did it? Should we have not done it? What should we have done? So the very process of str strategic prioritization is difficult internally. It's not self-evident. We also have partners across the spectrum of willingness and capability to partner with us that change over time. There's this great word, heteroscedasticity. Wow, that's a mouthful, right? That's alphabet soup. It's a super academic-y term that means a very simple thing. Variations vary varyingly, meaning you can't predict how something's going to change over time. It's the same with strategic partners. Look at Colombia, stalwart partner because we helped them with FARC and counter-narcotics. Venezuela, used to be, not anymore. Philippines, super strong partner, now we're not so sure. Kenya, very strong. Nigeria, right? So the fact is, strategic prioritization is hard internally, it's also hard externally. So how do we do that? I would argue that in that discussion, SOF plays a critical and unique role because of its low footprint translating to large potential impact, right? That's the thing about SOF, is you can take a relatively small amount of effort and personnel, and because of the network connections, 
personally, technologically, and so forth, have an outsized influence. So I'm not, in that sense, I think SOF should have a larger role in this discussion about prioritization. My two cents. Oh, and by the way, these are just my opinions. They do not officially <laughs> represent US government, DOD, or NDU, and my colleague the same. That goes for Professor Davidson, too, yes. I, I believe. Yeah. Well, Go ahead, caveat. John. <laughs> As we look at uh, what lessons learned do translate from Ukraine and potentially into uh, a conflict in South China Sea, uh, I think we also have to take a look at what are the things that we're noticing that are going to change the operational environment for irregular warfare going forward. And some of the things we're seeing are um, the increasing impact of non-state actors on that operational environment. And so a couple uh, examples reference Ukraine. Uh, I think most of us made the assumption based upon the, the massive amount of, of electronic warfare capability that the Russians had that they were going to come in and they were going to basically shut down the electronic magnetic spectrum and you weren't going to be able to talk, and the only thing that was going to get out was a little bit of uh, maybe HF, and that turned out not to be true. Um, and so uh, we were able to take advantage of leaving up the, the GSM towers, um, and the Ukrainians, I think, have effectively utilized that to, to do some targeting, and vice versa, maybe the Russians as well. Um, but when it came to providing secure, reliable communications, those weren't necessarily provided by us. You know, when it really needed it, Elon Musk showed up with Starlink and put some LEO satellites up at the top, dropped in some, some base stations, and was able to provide secure, reliable communications. Okay. Um, that wasn't a government entity that did that. Okay. If you look at the information environment and the, the social media hacktivists there, whether it's in Poland, whether it's Estonia, whether it's in Latvia, um, you can go onto websites and get access to um, tens of millions of Russian phone numbers or email addresses and send a prepackaged message to them you know, saying exactly, hey, this is what's happening on the ground in Ukraine with an attempt to, to penetrate the, the Russian uh, internet bubble that they've put, social media bubble they've put on their own country. And if you look from a cyber perspective, you have Anonymous that's attacking critical infrastructure in, inside of Russia. Okay? Um, so, how do you potentially enable those things? How do you take advantage of them? But on the opposite side, hey, what happens when those social media activists or anonymous are not aligned with our end states? Right? How do we protect ourselves from those non-state actors as well? Those are the things that are gonna change the operational environment going forward. Thanks, sir. General Braga, kind of taking it back to USASOC wide, um, how are you all looking, and talk about innovation, I think. So you talked about it being a mindset, and I know you're investing in your people, and I want to get to that, maybe some examples. But force-wide, are you looking at any innovations or changes in the force, and how it's structured, perhaps? Uh, sure. From <clears throat> We're taking some lessons learned from Ukraine, but even before that, we've made this pivot towards, again, the NDS and NS priorities to realize that some of the stuff we've developed previously and how we're organized was was optimized for counterterrorism, and we recognize that uh, a lot of that has to change to be ready for, uh, you know, large-scale combat operations. Um, so we are looking at everything from how we communicate to how we operate to what size. We're looking uh, heavily at robotics automation, man-on-man teamings, drone integration. Do we need new specialties? I cannot imagine a future state of warfare that does not have more drone technology and and application of AI being part of that man-on-man -man teaming than it is right now. I do not believe that can be an additional skill on an individual operator at this time. There's enough uh, overload when you talk about information advantage to the uh, individual operator to make sense of the senseless amount of ever-increasing amount of data. So I believe that has to be a, uh, a new, you know, perhaps a new military occupational spe uh, specialty, but we, we're doing our own research and experimentation and trying to find we have so many talented people in RSOF right now. Coders, they know Python, uh, um, they're building their own drones, they're using 3D printers, but we don't have the proper stair-step structure for their career progression to, to make sure they're quote unquote successful. Um, so we're experimenting with that, looking at individual skill fields and identifiers, as well as uh, branches and specialties. We've adapted our schoolhouse. Many of our courses have adapted just in the last year to address regular warfare. 
Uh, we continually update our culmination exercise across special forces, civil affairs, and psychological operations. We've created our own drone course. We have a misinformation, disinformation course. We're applying lessons learned readily. And because we own three centers of excellence inside the USOC formation, our own schoolhouse, uh, we can turn it very quickly, mm -hmm. very quickly and, and ingest these lessons learned. So I would say it's changing every day. Uh, and, and, and we need to continue to change. We need to take the change seriously. Um, we need to make sure it's, it's informed by looking backwards, but it's looking forward towards the challenges and the opportunities. So we're experimenting even with force design and how we're force design. What is the soft unit of action of the future? Is it two people and 20 drones? Is it one person and 100 drones? Is it, uh, what's the size of this unit of action? I don't even like to put a name on it because as soon as you put a name on it, people start thinking constrained. Well, this is a platoon, this is an ODA, this is an AOB, and you think backwards, well, this is what it was. Um, so we're doing a lot of uh, design work right now into the future uh, of, of what is needed for both steady state integrated deterrence and irregular warfare, and then should we need to be, be prepared for high-end conflict and large-scale combat operations. Great, thank you. Very interesting stuff. I, there, look at this stack of questions. Y'all did so great. <laughs> uh, I can't get to all of them, um, but I will start here. What are some of the key problems you see with the changes to warfare that could potentially be solved with innovative technologies, and how do we plan to get there? Mm. General Angle, I think that's all you, man. I didn't hear the first yeah. part. <laughs> <laughs> innovative technologies. Okay. Here, we're going to use them. I, I guess maybe I would alter it a little bit and say, I think we... When we talk about innovation a lot, we focus on technology yeah. and targeting and you know, emerging capabilities technology-wise. Perhaps there's, maybe you could talk a little bit about adopting te technologies that are in the human domain that maybe yeah. help us with understanding rather than you know, targeting. No, I think it's a great question. Um, and to, to rift off of some of General Braga's comments, um, I think when we look at the future and we look at the future operational environment, how do we modernize with that? Um, we're probably a little bit different than, than most um, organizations is we start with our people. People are our platform and we modernize through them. And so it's how do we modernize our people to take advantage of the technology that's available, right? But that makes make sure that we, we have the right people. Um, and this is a plug for, for uh, any particular book, but if you've read Thank You for Being Late uh, by Friedman, um, there's, a, there's a graph in there. Uh, and inside that graph is basically very simple. It's, a, it's got a linear line, which uh, explains really humans' ability to use the technology that's available to them. Right? And then there's an exponential line that really mirrors Moore's law, and that, that is technology, right? And somewhere around, I think it's 2003 or four, th those lines intersected. And now technology is vastly outpacing our ability to understand how to utilize it, right? So making sure that we have the right people uh, with the right knowledge, skills, and attributes to be able to take advantage of those innovative technologies is critical, and then go after those innovative technologies. So uh, the boss here has got a number of them, robotics, AI, data, analytics, transport, right? Those are all technologies that are available to us right now that how do we go about and, and utilize those most effectively to, to do the mission sets that we are. Um, we have some of the people in our force that um, have the proclivity to do that stuff. That may not be how, what we recruit, assess, selected, and trained them to do, but they do. And so the other challenge for us is how do we actually retain that talent? How do we keep them in the force, right? And that goes back to some of the things the, the boss talked about in terms of, of force design, right? Um, and as we look at force design, I think it's important to remember, so you'll take one particular element for us, uh, that unit of action is the operational detachment, right? When that operational detachment was built in 1952, right, it had 12 people on it, right? In 1952, they were responsible for primarily operating in complex environments that included three domains, land, sea, and air. Today, that same organization, that unit of action has to operate in land, sea, and air, cyber, and space, and the information environment and do all the things they were doing previously. So can you ask those same people to do all of those same things in three addi two additional domains in an additional environment? Right. Those are the things I think we have to, 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 uh, to really take a hard look at. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. I'd, I'd put in just a couple of quick things here too. I think th there's this concept of frugal innovation. So we, we tend to talk about developing technology and how we're going to use it. I think we, we are all cognizant, but I'll remind everyone that we're cognizant of this, right? That this tendency to innovate when you don't have resources or you aren't well trained, but you have access to some of that technology, I think is something that is really interesting to track as well. We saw it in Afghanistan, we've seen it in Ukraine. I think it has changed to some degree how we think about resistance as well, that you can empower an individual, right? And to me again, as the Cold War historian, this is really interesting in particular, not because of any, that, I mean, computing, right, was seismic in the way that the Cold War trajectory changed. But in terms of population-centric stuff, the way the Cold War ended was about, to a large degree, popular protest. So if we take that dynamic, this is again where you can't easily transfer a period in history to where we're at today. There are really important differences between the Cold War and where we're at today. But where we're at with some of that technology in terms of how we empower individuals for resistance, I think is very important to consider layered on to the fact that we know the Cold War, that sustained period of competition ended with the empowerment of humans with population centric focus. Yeah, you're seeing um, in Ukraine, you're seeing the use of drones, right? The ability to, to sense, understand, and then strike through the use of drones uh, using a lot of AI technology, right? Um, we have a, a, an unclassified effort that, that we've been working on actually over at Fayetteville State University where um, using technology that's available, commercial off the shelf, um, that allows us to, to build a network to communicate with our partners. So uh, imagine having the ability to, your partner has a, an endpoint device, right? Through the use of a QR code, we can give them um, access, zero trust access to a front side network that we own. But on the back side, we can enable them through, uh, with incredible amount of functionality through software as a service as well as data as a service, right? Without any program of records, just using commercial off the shelf capability. Right? I think we're gonna have to utilize more of that as the pace of technology continues to quicken and our acquisition system may not be able to keep up with that pace of technology. Yeah, I would double tap on that. That's one of the processes I think would be worthwhile of a holistic review in order to keep up with the pace of change um, just on the current battlefield. It, it needs to move at the, the, the speed of war in this case, uh, but the speed of technology innovation. So I think everything's struggling with that because of the, uh, as you talk about Moore's law and everything else, but policy, innovation, process, it's hard, having a hard time keeping up with the realities of new injects of that democratization and the price point of technology coming down so far. It used to be nation state only business and now it's everyone's business. Yeah. The debt democratization and diffusion of technology, right? We have to take advantage like our adversaries are taking advantage. It's certainly leveling the playing field, right? We need to be able to take advantage of that as well. You also, and this gets to one of the audience questions, are competing for talent and, you know, recruiting the best and the brightest and, and what we need for the future force. How are you all um, working to retain, you know, the talent that you have? and recruit you know, new talent in this environment? Sure, I, at, the, at the larger level, we, I just had a great interaction with about 18 different uh, tags from the different states down there to figure out how to better leverage their state partnership programs as well as the two special forces group we have in uh, the National Guard. But we're exploring different options as well as permeability amongst the three compositions there. Can we provide different uh, uh, you know, career fields and career trajectories for people to serve uh, amongst COMPO 1, 2, and 3. Maybe they want to go back to their home state and serve, but still, uh, we may not even need them to come physically to Fort Bragg or to physically deploy for some of the activities we're asking them to do. And, it, and in, in some cases, it might even be better for them to do it in, a, in a, their home state due to private and government uh, partnerships and capability that exist, uh, I would say, in the technology field for sure. So that's, I would say that's one aspect that we're looking to uh, uh, compete. Um, we're certainly part of the Army, and it, it's, it's nationwide, the, the, the challenge for talent. Businesses are talking about it. Universities are talking, talking about it. Certainly the services are talking about it. And I would say we're a microcosm uh, of all the services in that battle for talent, and we, get a, we have to think creatively. Certainly it's General McConville's uh, number one priority of people, and uh, we're trying to think creatively of uh, how to actively, actively retain the talent we have and then recruit the future talent we do need. But Rick, you got an idea on that? 
Spence? I was going to give a, just a small example. The 38 Gulf Program is a great example of this, right? So, so 38 Gulf Program Civil Affairs is an attempt to bring subject matter experts from across industry, public policy, administration, academia, and governance, and bring them in and say, we're going to tap into that expertise, whether it's break in case of emergency or steady state analysis. And, and it's a great way to draw people who maybe wouldn't necessarily have chosen a career path as a green suitor, but want to serve, and now here's a vehicle for doing it. So adapting the mechanisms, the infrastructure, the authorities, the fundings, to create that opportunity is fantastic because now you have the ability, if something like in Afghanistan kicked off again, you have a deeper bench of experts than we had in 2001. So for the next conflict in Taiwan or wherever else, you got more to pull from. Just to clarify, 38 Gulf being civil affairs basically off the street, yes. Yes. Uh, the Thank same you. way we've, we've, for really the third time in our lifespan and special forces, we have direct recruit 18 x-ray programs off the street for special forces soldiers, which uh, now we're doing for civil affairs and experimenting in, in, uh, with other specialties. Okay. Another uh, question from the audience here. Considering what you see as a regular warfare problem sets of the near future and the importance of partnerships, what partnerships for example, intra DOD, interagency, multinational or commercial, what partnerships do you see as flourishing and which does Army saw still need to invest more in? Okay. Um, I think that's one of the great lessons learned from the global war on terrorism. Um, it, was, it was just magical and it was flat out enjoyable to be downrange working together with our interagency and intel community and even our partner nation interagency and intel community on a Focus mission set. Um, I see that same coalescence happening now. That there is a recognition of uh, this. Uh, you know, our, our peer adversaries are absolutely trying to erode collectively our our national security advantages. And as we seek those enduring advantages, I think it's at this critical stage as we're we're building those teams. So I'm actually always glass half full. That there is absolute recognition that uh, um, it, it's going to be more than just government. It needs to be a whole nation approach here. But as far as the government side, uh, we are actively planning, uh, and I would say the initial stages of campaigning together. Um, could it be better? Could it be more robust? Absolutely. Um, but I'm actually positive on the trajectory you're on. But uh, Rick, if you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, Carolyn, I think it was you that said um, in the future you're going to have more of an environment where DOD is the supporting agency versus supported. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, as, as much as we talk about how, how is a regular warfare going to change in the future, I think it's important to also look at hey, how, what's not going to change about it. Right? It's still going to be about allies and partners. It's still going to have indigenous forces involved in it. It's still going to be that, that struggle for the relevant narrative and the fight over the population. That's the battlefield. I would also, one of the, I would also offer one of those things that's not going to change right, is the need to be able to blend the Title 10, Title 22, Title 50 environments, right, to, to ensure that we have an interagency, and I would offer again, whole of government, whole of nation approach to these problems. And so uh, the, the lessons that we learned in the last 20 years, we, we did come together in those types of environments where we were able to operate effectively. We can't let those become eroded as we get less touches, quote unquote, on the battlefield. They're gonna be more important going forward when we look at strategic competition. So it's, it may be more about do we have the right relationships in the right places inside those agencies um, and do we need to adjust those from where we're more probably focused on counterterrorism and now we need to be focused more on strategic competition. So it's a shift inside those agencies. I, I mean, I'd, you take one in particular, counter threat finance. So USASOC has a heavy hand in that and a lead for the United States Army, but we fully recognize the tools of the national, uh, we'd be a supporting element to the other elements that are out there, Treasury, FBI, CTOC, and the like, but is absolutely a part of our adversaries' forms of irregular warfare against us. Uh, as as uh, Spencer talked about, you know, one belt, one road, and the, in my opinion, the erosion of uh, sovereignty in many countries around the world because of these uh, one-sided deals they're making, uh, the military certainly might not be the right tool. We might be supporting another facet of the United States government or the international community 
uh, especially when you're talking banking commissions, commerce, uh, and the like. I see that as a critical growth industry moving forward in order to see ourselves. It really starts with, if you're truly campaigning, you need a common intel picture. And the common intel picture, I would say, we're probably guilty as charges. The military, hey, I need to wait for this thing or this physical place on the earth to be surrounded with a fence line, having someone with a camouflage uniform and AK-47, then I'll start worrying about it because now it's a military target. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. The threat is just as real, it just might not be wearing a military uniform. So instead of counting just red icons, we do need the help of the interagency and the IC to look at the holistic threat and really have a dime fill common intel picture of which when we do operational activities investments, we can grade our own homework is this leading to and contributing towards deterrence or escalation or having no effect at all? So I, I would say it's critical. Uh, we would fail if we did not have you know, the, uh, the unity of effort across the, uh, the IC and the IA. Yeah, and I think the operative word there is unity of effort because we're never gonna get unity of command. That, that's just not- Never had happen. it in counterterrorism. Yeah, never, we're still looking for the person that was in charge of the GWAT after what, 20 <laughs> years. It's not gonna happen, we just have to recognize that, right? But getting unity of effort, that is absolutely critical. Yeah, I think that just there's one more quick point on that, right? We spend a lot of time talking about resilience in other populations. We need resilience within our own population too, right? So how we get the American population to understand that there really is, in a, in a sustained period of competition, there's not gonna be a simple bifurcation between domestic and foreign. There's gonna be a lot of overlap there. So whether it's finance or whether it's information operations, this is something that we need to get the American population on board with and ready to be more resilient so that those vulnerabilities aren't exploited at home either. So one place where all these converge is in the point of building wargaming within the, the larger services, but also within SOF. So USASOC, as well as Big Army, have wargaming initiatives, something that JSOC is also standing up. So what exactly is the purpose of a wargame? It is to address these issues. It's not just capabilities assessments, it's also, do we have the right things for the job? Meaning, do we have the right tools? Do we know how to use it properly? And is it gonna do the job in this place? But one of the things that's often missing in our sort of CT construct is we don't really necessarily talk about green as an active player. It's sort of an assumed thing. Well, green's supportive, meaning green meaning partners. And yet green is an active player. If we were to war game what was going on in, I don't know, Ukraine before it kicked off, Ukraine would have a very large voice in this process. So that's something that we ought to be thinking more about is these are not just partners. And I, my historian colleague, Professor Davidson, political scientist, Yes, there are certain contextual uniquenesses of the Cold War, but there's also some commonality, and we ought to emphasize those, perhaps in our narrative to the American people. We are facing a serious existential threat right now, just as we did in the past. General Angle, I know you just completed a trip to the Indo-PACOM region. Any impressions you would share you know, that from our partners and how they're looking at irregular warfare? First, I would say that we've got some incredible partners um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and I had just an opportunity to visit a couple of them, whether it's the, the Thais or the Filipinos, uh, the Japanese. Um, we've built generational relationships. Um, General Braga can tell you about some of those generation, gener generational relationships, having gone to, to school with some of the most senior folks inside of the, the Thai Special Forces community. Um, I, I was able to see folks that I had, I had done exercises and operations with all the way back to 2008. So um, it just highlights the point of the, the value of those relationships and the importance of them. But we have some incredible allies there and partners. Um, they uh, certainly still have counterterrorism problems in, in some of their countries, the, the Filipinos, for example. And they, they still have an insurgency. Um, down in uh, the Sula Archipelago, uh, as well as the, the Thais in southern Thailand. Um, but they are certainly aware of uh, and are certainly making changes inside their military and inside their national defense documents to focus more on the, the strategic competition threat. Um, and so, again, they, I think they'll play a critical role with us as we go forward. Uh, and uh, to handle those uh, potential problems in the South China Sea. Yeah, I would just add that, I mean, for those who haven't had much time in the Indo-PACOM theater, I mean, seven of the 10 largest armies in the world 
exist in the Indo-PACOM theater. A lot of people, a lot of, a lot of think tanks, a lot of academics write about, and they just see Indo-PACOM as this big blue, blue sky, blue water. But the reality is the largest armies in the world reside there in Indo-PACOM theater. The, in most cases, not all, in most cases, the army is usually a very uh, heavily influential uh, entity, at least in their MOD uh, structure. And in some cases, not all, special operations forces are usually the premier unit inside those armies that usually matriculate to the top and have an, uh, a very outsized uh, ability to influence. Again, uh, just thought and, and efforts and initiatives and relationships moving forward. I think that's critical because it comes back to the human domain. It really comes back to the human domain. So uh, those relationships become even more critical. The interoperability with our partners, yes, there is no such thing as a, as, a, as, a, as a NATO, but again, each country will act in their own accordance. And we have so much in common with many countries around the world uh, where we do align in our, in our values, in our norms, and our desires that is mutually beneficial and usually regionally beneficial. But there's one adversary in the world that doesn't treat it that way. There's one adversary in the world that treats it as bilateral and wants nothing to do with multi multilateral. There's one country in the world that wants to erode international rules, norms, and behavior that has collectively raised the world's, pop, you know, world's uh, level of living uh, great, greater than ever before, and that's the People's Republic of China. Yeah. Um, so what we don't want to do is, is put people in a, a corner and make them a decision. It's a reality that you have to live. You can't change your zip code. You can't pick up and move. Uh, so that's a reality. We have a, 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 uh, a very important relationship with, the, the, with China. And again, not to get into the academic or the economic, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's just the reality of the world. That's a good thing. Our ultimate job here is to prevent World War III. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to avoid traditional war and kinetic war. But make no bones about it, what our adversary calls it is warfare, with the three forms of warfare. Mm -hmm. Legal, moral, psychological, mm -hmm. that's what they call it. So first you must, you know, Clausewitz 101, recognize the type of war you're in before you start fighting it. Mm -hmm. So I think that is important. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that, Go ahead. Uh, yes. We're on, I know the time, the timer, we're, on, we're out of time, um, but that was a great ending um, for us to have the consequences, very real world consequences on the mind. So please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you. Well done. You're well done, well done. <laughs> wow, what, what a great discussion. I think we could have taken that one a few more hours. So thanks to the panel. Thanks, Megan, for leading, leading that. And I think it's, gonna, it's a great lead in to our next panel the changing character of warfare. So that's gonna start at 1530, so please take a short break. Uh, join us in the exhibit hall for some refreshments and be ready to resume at 1530.